Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Surge podcast. Uh, it's been a while, eh? So, yeah, um, I've been on hiatus for a while uh, because that's what pandemics do when you're covering the ICU. Um, my practice is now exclusively ICU, and I spend a lot of time dealing with the situation that we're all in right now, unfortunately. Um that's reason or excuse number one. Reason number two is because I was hoping to sort of start doing more um, fringe, cool topics. Um, uh, over the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping to begin to do a lot less of the clinical bedside stuff and more uh, practical, uh, forward thinking discussions on uh, what I feel could be uh, concepts or topics that may be underrepresented, but might be things that we should worry about, right? Um, but for today's uh, talk, I was hoping to talk about, uh, you know, general rules for central lines. And if you've ever put in a central line, or the first time that you put in a central line, rather, the first thing I think all of us are told is to never let go of the guide wire. Or as some of my mentors used to say, never let go of that fucking guide wire. And uh, unfortunately, you're all, as we're going to find out today, you're always going to let go of that guide wire. Not always, but it is an eventuality. And the literature supports a mentality that this is an eventuality. And this isn't uh, something that's going to be uh, in a, a situation that you're never going to see during your career. You're going to see it if you work with guide wires. And sometimes it is your fault, sometimes it isn't. But let's look at a typical scenario in which it could potentially happen. So uh, you're activated as part of a rapid response team. It's the 1st of July. Uh, you're the new fellow. You've put in central lines before. You've done it in the operating room multiple times. You've done it in the trauma bay multiple times. You know what you're doing. But you're the new fellow. And uh, this is a new center to you. And in the uh, regular surgical ward, uh, you find a 65-year-old patient in septic shock with a working diagnosis of diverticulitis. He's being given oral contrast, uh, and they're getting him ready for a CT scan. But now his systolic is 60, and that's why they activated the rapid response team. And there's no ultrasound in that ward, because believe it or not, in academic centers and ivory tower centers and centers that adhere to certain standards of practice, there are lots of dedicated surgical wards where there will be ultrasound machines. But we have different standards across the U.S. We have different standards across Canada. And we have different standards across the world. And so there is going to be that eventuality where the ultrasound has to be brought up from a different place like the ICU. In addition to that, the nurses aren't comfortable starting peripheral levofed or norepinephrine or dobutamine. Take your pick or your poison. And they're insisting that you put the central line in right now. And you've certainly put in uh, blind subclavians, you've certainly put in blind IJs in specific situations under supervision, all your residency. But you haven't put in enough of them to be confident. And at this point, the patient's getting really agonal, and they want to intubate, and they want to start giving fluids, but all he has is this dinky IV with a D5NS running at 80 cc's an hour because they're afraid of his CHF because he's 64 and nothing's documented. Because he's a fresh admission, he just came up from the ED, and he's waiting for a CT. And so you're in that position where it's, it's a very chaotic situation, and you have, uh, you know, my background is in surgery, so I think I get to say this. You have a very assertive um, group of surgical uh, residents who are are also in the same boat as you are. This is the 1st of July. And they're pressuring you to put a line in. And you make a correct decision in putting it in as a femoral line. As this will reduce your pneumothorax risk effectively and will likely lead to a good outcome. As you're putting the line in, however, uh, you encounter a lot of difficulty. First you hit the artery and you're not sure what's going on try to push it out of the way, you know your anatomy, because you've done it before, right? It's, this isn't something that's very difficult for you to do. It's just a very difficult situation, and certainly not the situation that you want on your first day at work in your new critical care fellowship. And so you're really frustrated at this point, and your attending is coming up right now. Your attending comes up, and he decides to take over just as you put the guide wire in. He takes over the case, and 
puts the line in and then you flush it and you're flushing it down and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and this was a very difficult line even for him and there was a kink and he thinks that he went close to the inguinal ligament there's multiple things going on at this point and then the two three hours afterwards once you're down in the ICU you order your x-rays and uh, the surgeons order an x-ray of the abdomen because they're looking for a free perf now because he's too septic and he's an ileus and his abdominal pain looks a little bit worse you haven't really tubed him because this is a septic shock you don't necessarily need to tube them and you get your plain abdominal x-ray and you see this and there's a guide wire extending to the internal jugular and that's when you physically feel mortified because you let go of the guide wire you get a CT scan and it's definitely in the IVC which as you'll hear later is not a bad thing now if you're the attending involved in this case and you're listening to this uh, I don't care what background you are you could be the best vascular surgeon in the world and can handle any complication if you get called to help out or if you get called to made, be made aware of the situation whether it's as a consult to fix the problem as a vascular surgeon, general surgeon, or whatever, an interventional radiologist, the radiologist doing the CT scan, or the actual person who uh, was directly involved in inserting the uh, guide wire um, and dislodging it from the mechanism that you're using. The first thing that you need to do is not shout at them. And don't get pissed off. Because uh, if you're from an interventional radiology or surgical background, you know for a fact that you've had complications. Do not tell me you haven't had complications, right? We've all had them. If you're from a uh, radiology background, you know you've had undercalls. You know that one case where they did a deal and they found something that you should have picked up on the CT. It's very rare and it's very subtle and oftentimes it can be explained by other confounding factors, but you've been there. And this is the same situation right here. It's a situation that is very humbling because there is a dogma of never letting go of the guide wire. But it is also a situation that is not only very humbling, but is also a situation that traditionally was treated with open massive surgeries. And so the person who you're talking to, who's heard never let go of the guide wire a thousand times and has actually let go of the guide wire, he messed up the first rule of putting in a line. Cut that guy some slack. It's not because of inexperience. And it's not the first time or the last time that this will happen. So this has happened multiple times. And it hasn't just happened in places where they don't have ultrasound. It has happened in places with ultrasound and without ultrasound. It hasn't happened just because somebody made a mistake. There have been people who have had central lines break at the hilt and free float into ventricles that have had to be extracted. There have been people who have managed to get the guide wire in, rip open a pneumothorax, and have it impacted in the arterial side of the aorta, and actually have it lodged there for up to five years. Five years, right? There have even been people where it's been lost there, and it's waited to erode through the chest wall, literally. This is not something that never happens. This is not a theoretical narrative. This has happened across the world. This has happened in European centers of excellence. This has happened in cardiac surgery. This has happened while putting in reboas, while putting in ECMOs. This has happened everywhere. And so because it has happened everywhere on every continent, do not assume that it will never happen to you. Assume that it may happen to you and you should have a contingency plan for it that doesn't involve panicking or shouting at the resident or the fellow involved. So you as the fellow, don't panic. And remember that it will happen. Also remember that the literature in the past 10 years has had nothing but success stories and recoveries, for the most part. There's a couple of things that you should do the minute you detect it. And I know that this is humbling, but do not panic get through the checklist of things that you have to do once you've detected it. The first thing that you should do is every subclavian and internal jugular line gets a chest x-ray. The second thing is have an independent instrument count once you're done. So in surgery we do that. We have double instrument counts. 
The nurses, the scrub nurses will double check after each other, right? Third thing is the minute you've detected this error or this complication, do cross-sectional imaging because you don't know if it's in the artery or the vein. The third thing is you need to understand for the past five years, the, the gold standard in care for all of these situations has been without a doubt endovascular. And in certain situations, venous cut downs on extremely superficial veins that are easy to access like the internal jugular. Yes, it's called the internal jugular, but surgically for any competent trauma or vascular surgeon, its exposure is something that we're taught very early on in our careers. So it's not a big deal. And there will rarely be major surgery unless there is a vessel perforation as well. For an isolated foreign body situation, such as a broken catheter, or a guide wire, or even a kinked guide wire, it's extremely rare to require surgery, okay? Now, when do you debrief, panic, and show remorse? You do it after the issue is taken care of, and you do it with the stakeholders involved. So it should be done with your attending who was involved on the day, with the rapid response team that was with you and shouting at each other, with the general surgeons uh, or the vascular surgeons or the interventional radiologists involved in the decision-making process and the recovery of the foreign body, right? And there is no good literature on the risk factors, but we do have guidelines on how to avoid it. My concern is the guidelines to avoid it do not tell you how to treat the problem. One. Two, they do not elucidate the direct causes. Now, from my experience looking at these cases and looking up the literature and from, you know, our departmental experience in general, um, I'm not going to lie, these things, they happen. Um, panicking doesn't help anybody. So a panic room is a very stressful situation, right? Unknown anatomy, whether it's because you're used to using an ultrasound, now you're not using it, doesn't help you because you've lost the muscle memory. If you're doing a different procedure, you're not going to have the same memory cues to remember how to do things. The sequence is different now, right? Inexperience in a particular approach, such as a femoral approach, which is not a routine approach anymore, traditionally, is another risk factor that we have to understand. Yes, in trauma, we use the femoral approach a lot. But in general, it doesn't happen that much. When there's more than one person helping out and taking over the procedure in an unsafe manner, and so I would recommend that if you are going to hand over the procedure, either don't put the guide wire in or put a clamp on it. Put your actual needle holder that you're going to use to take your stitch, clamp it at the end of the guide wire, and then hand over the procedure. And even then, I'd be extremely nervous, right? Okay. Now, recognize that this is not a complication that is exclusive to us in critical care or trauma or acute care in the emergency room. This is a complication that will occur anytime you are working in critical care or angiography or in a cath lab or in ECMO or with Reboa. And I could even argue that you will more likely, you're more likely to require surgical intervention in those situations and you're more likely to have open surgery and you're more likely to require um, have kinked guide wires that are harder to extract endovascularly significantly more challenging with possible even breakage of the guide wire simply because of the fact that you use stiffer guide wires than the central line ones thicker ones and they might and they're more faceted towards a different approach right with the central line guide wire it's a very very thin wire it's very pliable it's very gentle you can't poke out very easily. However, with uh, the types of wires that we use with ECMOs and Reboas, you can get into trouble, right? The only, you know, s safety here is that with ECMOs and Reboas, the wire length is so much longer that it's very hard to do that. The, the main reason that's being reported in the literature is actually anatomical difficulty and an inability to pull out the, the guide wire. Similarly with percutaneous valve approaches. Very, very, very rarely would you require follow-up imaging. I would say that the recommendation is if you have a visible hematoma or if there's a surgical concern. However, guide wires for me aren't a big deal because like I said, when you look at the literature, it's not that bad. It's a bad thing to happen. We all feel horrible when these things happen. But I wouldn't say that 
it's the worst thing that can happen. For me, the worst thing that can happen is hitting the artery, especially when the standard of care is ultrasound. For everything, one could argue subclavian, not so much. But for IJ and for femoral, I see no reason not to use an ultrasound machine, especially because we have high BMI patients now around the world. It's not just the U.S. Obesity is a growing problem. Your anatomy is going to be more difficult. Accidental arterial injuries can be horrendous in the literature. They require significantly more technical closures. They have a higher uh, incidental finding of occlusive disease. And uh, they require um, revision of, of the closure mechanism in certain cases. Uh, there are cases reported in the literature where there's been uh, iatrogenic uh, vertebral artery strokes. And as you can see from the x-ray, you're not going to detect a vertebral artery injury very easily, simply because you don't see it every day, right? So um, there are various ways that you can detect it. I'll go through them. But uh, I would say, just like the recommendations in this case report and literature review, you know, follow the anesthesia guidelines or the critical care guidelines, whatever institution guidelines that you have. Use ultrasound before, after, and during insertion, right? Get the best picture that you can. Confirm with the venous blood gas and order a chest x ray as a priority. The quicker you detect these things, the better the outcome, right? Whenever the injury is suspected, right? and you've dilated or done something of that nature, do not pull out your dilator and do not pull out the line. Wait until the surgeon comes in. Vascular intervention should be prompt because these are devastating strokes that are preventable. Similarly, it's worse if it's undetected as a priority. And, you know, the literature reports everything from 3 to 15%, but when it's undetected and you give something like anticoagulation, Expect a hemorrhagic transformation. Expect that problem to be there. And what, what annoys me even more is when I come in in the mornings and I see a hematoma and a couple of needle pricks, and they say, well, I, I had one arterial stick. Here's my problem with one arterial stick. It will develop into a pseudoaneurysm, and you may not have actually hit the carotid. You may be genuinely on your way to hitting the IJ, and you hit an intramuscular artery because you don't have a clear line of sight to the IJ. Right, these dissections can ex these pseudoaneurysms can be a problem. They can expand and obstruct an airway. They can expand and cause uh, uncontrolled bleeding, and they can actually cause strokes. Similarly, just like you can have pseudoaneurysms, you can have dissections, and these dissections can extend. They can erode through into arteriovenous fistulae, and you can induce arteriovenous fistulae and not detect them. So for detection, the best approach is chest x-ray, waveform, arterial and venous blood gas at the same time and comparing the two, post-procedural ultrasound, and document any hematoma for reassessment. It's absolutely important, even if you just stuck the needle in. Yes, in most cases, nothing's going to happen. And my concern is you can never be 100% okay with something that looks like this in an x-ray. Because here's my problem with pulmonary artery cannulations and people who have lots of other problems going on. When that happens, and you literally hit the pulmonary artery, which is extremely difficult to do in my opinion, I don't know how you're going to fix that, A. B, I don't know how I'm going to detect the anatomy without a CT scan. Now, this was reported sort of pre-CT era. I think it's very impressive that they picked up on it. They ended up doing an angio. Again, you have to adhere to guidelines and central line bundles, but there's no clear guide on what to do. I would recommend a similar approach to the, the approach with guide wires in getting cross-sectional anatomy, CT angio as a standard, detecting it early through what we discussed, and um, I would recommend uh, involving IR and vascular surgery early and doing follow-up imaging just to make sure that there's no evolution into a pseudoaneurysm or, or a thrombosis of, of any kind. In summary, these things are an eventuality, as you can see from a ton of papers out there, right? And it's not just the ED or the ICU or the trauma bay. It's going to be a, a, a evolving problem in other fields that are using very complex devices, especially as, as we use more, more and more complex devices, they're more likely to malfunction. And unless our experience with these devices evolves during our training, right, it's going to be very hard to maintain.
There is an argument to be made that if you're doing something fairly advanced and you have the facility for it, so something like a Reboa or an ECMO, it may be a good idea to have fluoro in the room. Because I would argue, and this is just a theoretical narrative, that if you use something like a Reboa and you have fluoro, the chances of you misplacing it or misplacing the actual guide wire are extremely, extremely low. I know that ultrasound is quite effective, but like I said, people's anatomy is changing. We're getting bigger, more obese patients that are more technically demanding for us to manage. And it, we're extending the criteria for things like Reboa and ECMO, and we're doing more and more ED or uh, extracorporeal CPR situations that will have the same risk factors for guide wire and cannulation issues. This has been Saud Al-Zaid. Thank you for listening. Please like, comment, and subscribe.